Hey everybody, welcome back to the show. So glad to have you here today. We're going to be talking about how up to 51% of all homes, at least in the United States, and I'll share many parts of the world, have this toxin. Now, this toxin isn't always visible. However, before you become very skeptical, it is easily measurable. So that is how we know, and I've got lots of quotes here from Center for Disease Control, National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. We've got the World Health Organization. So again, whether you kind of believe in all these bodies or not, the EPA and others, um, regardless, they all agree. Everyone's in agreement that this specific toxin is greatly affecting people's health. And it is something called mold. Now, if you've heard about mold before, which I'm sure you have, it's usually in relation to, relation to oh, I left um, some raspberries in the fridge for a week and I opened them up and they had all this white fuzzy stuff all over them, right? Or I had leftovers in the fridge and I opened up the container and it was all moldy, right? So we kind of know what that mold looks like, but we don't always think that it is also in our home, not just from food, but from water damage. And actually, water damage is the number one reason why over half of us have mold in our homes. So I want to take you through that here today and actually how to begin to solve this problem because mold can lead to a lifetime of chronic-based illness. I actually talked about it on a previous podcast, which I'll link up here today in the show notes, which will be at stephencabral.com slash 3287 as one of the hidden stealth pathogens. So That simply means that these mold spores could be floating around and you don't see them. And that is because they're in your vents. I'll talk about where where to find them in just a moment. Uh, In your shower, in your HVAC vents, in your air conditioning wall unit or window unit, behind sheetrock from a leak or water damage, same with ceilings. So we'll go through all the different reasons and places they could be, but let's just keep in mind. Here's a few statistics and then I'll give you the symptoms to see if you might be suffering from mold-based issues as well. 30% of all schools in the U.S. have plumbing-based problems with leaks. If you go into your kid's classroom, you'd be shocked. If you look at the ceiling, there's oftentimes stains, water stains. Behind that and above that is almost always mold. So again, we start with the inner schools. 27% of schools have roofing problems that could lead to interior or exterior water leakage. I mention this because kids can be dealing with mold issues as well. I had mold issues when I was a child, didn't even know it until later tested around 18, 19 years old. 85% of commercial office buildings have experienced water damage in the past, and 45% of office buildings have current leaking problems. This is pretty outrageous because think about it. Besides your home, it can be in the school, and it can also be in an office. So I'm not saying any of this to scare you, but what I do want to let you know is that it can lead to symptoms, and I want to see if you have any of these symptoms. So post-nasal drip, sinus congestion, itchy, watery eyes, Red, bloodshot eyes, skin rashes, brain fog, histamine issues, um, overall inflammatory joint pain, muscle weakness, basically mitochondrial issues because it directly affects the mitochondria. Any gut-related issues or bloating and or leaky gut autoimmune because it affects the intestinal lumen. Lumen, uh, that's the outer edge or the lining of the intestines. And then kidney and or liver problems. And here's why. So essentially there is mold and one of the metabolites or essentially the breakdown of mold is mycotoxins. So we can get primary and secondary mycotoxicosis from food and it's improperly stored grains and fruit and all sorts of different things can grow mold if they got a little damp, if they got a little wet. And we can eat those as well. It can be in dairy from uh, cows uh, or animals that are fed feed, which Oftentimes, it's wheat and different grains that are just left out. It's rained on. It gets tons of mold. The cows eat it no matter what. It goes into their bodies and into the milk, and there are aflatoxins in the milk itself. It's actually one of the number one causes. Okay, so there's that. But then we have our water-damaged buildings. So I just named off some of those symptoms, and I don't want them to eventually lead to some of the chronic-based diseases, which is the liver inflammation, the kidney scarring, the Alzheimer's, the Parkinson's, uh, the autoimmune immune issues, as I talked about before, and many mental health-based disorders as well. So 
These are impro and these are you know really important things that we look at, and oftentimes you know most doctors are just not equipped. They, they haven't been taught to even look for mold because they wouldn't know necessarily what to look for, what to test for, because the, the test is actually, the best one to run is a mycotoxins test. So you test your mold, you test your home or office or school for mold. You can use uh, a Petri dish, like you can actually get these mold test kits. Uh, I'll, I'll give you links for these here today. Um, you can have a mold remediation company come in and they'll oftentimes test for free. Sometimes they charge, sometimes it's free. Um, you can get a mold collection test kit where you're testing essentially dust and you're seeing how much mold is in the dust. And then you can get really professional ones. That's what I did when we just purchased our uh, last home where they test the outside air because mold is all, it's all around us. Like it's not, it's like there's heavy metals in the environment. Yes. There's also mold in the environment. When leaves fall during the fall season, uh, they begin to break down and it causes mold. But especially when you're in like New England, where I grew up, uh, snow falls on top of the leaves. They begin to decay and mold. And then springtime, all of that mold then is there when the snow melts. And that can be a really difficult season for individuals like it was for me in April. Okay. So here, those are the different ways that we can do that. But the way that we test the human body is not testing mold in the body. We test for mycotoxins in the body, which are toxic compounds that come from mold themselves. And so that's typically what we test for. Some of them are things like um, uh, trichocythines, uh, aflatoxins, ochratoxin A, citronin. These are all mycotoxins that we look for that enable us to say, oh, this person's been exposed to mold. Now, here's the other nice thing about that lab test is that most mycotoxins, fortunately, only have a couple hours to a day um, half-life. That means that if your ochratoxin A would be a different example, which can be over 30, it, excuse me, about 31 to 35 days. So that can be a little bit longer term. However, most of the others, it would show recent exposure. So you know you're being exposed. Now you can do the detective work. So I'll link up that lab as well. Um, that one obviously um, is, that comes with a, a health coaching call, explains everything to you. So I'll link that up. That's the mold mycotoxins test. Um, I've got a bunch of statistics. Let me just give you a couple of them. I won't bore you with all of this. And then we'll get to where to look for these things and how to begin to eradicate it. Okay. So asthma problems and mold are closely related. Uh, with about 40% of uh, asthma attacks being triggered by mold or other allergens. That's pretty unbelievable, right? So like if you have asthma and you have allergies, you should be tested for mold. No doubt about it. Mold grows quickly in wet environments, so it's important to clean it up. Um, here's why. 25% of the population has a genetic predisposition that makes them more susceptible to mold illnesses. So if you have a detox pathway breakdown, remember, it overwhelms the liver. This is a really important thing. I don't, I can't get too deep into phase one, phase two right now, but this is why, you know, we're such big advocates of uh, obviously education, but doing things like functional medicine detoxes, giving your liver support, because that is how ultimately we get it out of the body. What I'm going to do next week is I'm actually going to detail, this is the mold protocol. This is how we take people through it. So I will literally give you those three steps copy it however you like. The, I, my goal is to open source all of this information for the world. And I teach this in depth as well in IHP level three. We've got amazing students going through that right now. So what I'm going to be able to do is I'm going to be able to refer you to those integrative health practitioner level threes to be able to take you through mold uh, detox protocols, as well as even mold testing. So that's pretty exciting. Okay. Uh, let's just give you a couple more. So up to 25% of people, as I told you before, are predisposed to mold toxicity, mold illness. And the reason is they can't break down the mycotoxins as well. So it leads to things like allergies, hypersensitivity, respiratory problems, such as asthma, wheezing, coughing. If you get a little uh, tickle base cough, uh, any issues like that, especially even lying down that can be the post nasal drip, uh, with some of them even more severe, such as memory loss, depression, anxiety, and reproductive problems. I didn't talk about this, but I believe it's pronounced Zia Rila known. And again, I'm just going off by memory right now. This one actually affects reproductive organs in both men and women. It affects sperm motility and it affects the ovaries in women and can mimic estrogen based dominance as well. So that was a very interesting one when we're going through the research and teaching that as well. All right. So I could go on and on about all the different 
unhealthy effects it has on the body. And if you've been struggling with hard to treat health-based conditions, I would look into it as one of the underlying root causes. Now let's take a look at where you may find it the most. So I talked about the food. Certain foods more prone to mold would be things like avocados, bananas, berries, but really comes down to packaged products. Because you can see when you open cut an avocado in half, you can see if it's moldy, right? As a banana starts to get old brown, you can see it start to get moldy. With raspberries, you can see them start to get moldy. So like we know those things. So what might be a little bit more challenging is when you're buying things like grains or nuts or coffee or wine, you may not see the mold. So the goal is to then purchase from a company that does mold testing and that it's mold free. So mold free coffee. Coffee, right, would be a great one. Great one. Um, same with grains. Same with oats. All of those. All of those things as well. All right. So now, where should we look though? Besides foods, water leaks from pipes, the roof, or around windows. That's the first one. The second one is that if you've had heavy rains or any storms or purchasing a house, have they had leaks before? Because if there's been consistent leaking, especially in a human environment that most likely led to some mold growth. Okay. And there are different types of mold. It's not just black mold. That's one of them, right? But that's that's uh, only one type. Um, condensation, if you can see it kind of in cloudy windows, or um, if you can see bubbles on the paint on walls or in ceiling, that's a good indicator. Cracks on a ceiling could indicate a previous water exposure, especially if you see the tape coming up a little bit between the sheetrock. Again, most likely got a little wet. That stickiness started to peel off then. Dampness in basements, crawl spaces, or attics, poorly maintained HVAC system. So heating, um, ventilation, air conditioning, I think that's what HVAC stands for. And you want to make sure that you're not getting molds and any dips in the HVAC system. So the tubing that flows through the house, if it's not flowing all down and there are dips and that water's allowed to stay stagnant, mold can begin to grow. Now there are different systems you can put in place. I can talk about that on a, on a future podcast uh, to be able to keep the condensation from building up in an HVAC system, um, as well as using different UV light, et cetera, in those places where mold would be most likely to grow. All right. What else? Uh, carpet or furniture that has got, gotten wet before. Inadequate ventilation in bathrooms, kitchens, and laundry rooms. Those are the biggest places to look. Look behind your washer. Uh, look behind. Look under the sink to see if it started to grow uh, anywhere there. If you've ever had a sink leak as well. Insufficient or improper insulation in walls or ceilings, just allowing the moisture to come in. And then just again, one in general, I think that this is really important, is storing wet things in a closet or a damp, dark space, just to allow mold to grow. All right. So now I know this is a, I know I'm giving a lot of tips in one show. Please do feel free to go back uh, and re-listen to this. But next week, I want to get you in the mold protocol. So I kind of want to give you a big show in this right now. So the goal, of course, is to find the leaks in your home, fix them. Because you don't want to deal with a mold-based issue. And mold behind sheetrock or anywhere else, it's a living thing. And it's going to continue just to eat up any organic material like paper, wallpaper, et cetera, live on it, grow, and continue then just to keep growing and growing and growing. And so when you do remove it, they usually remove about six feet from when you can see it to be able to make sure they got all of it. The next thing is this. You got to reduce the humidity. If you live in a humid area, you have to keep that air conditioner on just a little, not, not super cold, but you got to keep it on a little bit to reduce the humidity or even use a dehumidifier in certain areas like basements as well. Proper ventilation goes a long way. You don't want that thickness of the air, the humidity, the moisture to build up, especially in bathrooms, right? If you need to open a window, open a window if you don't have a good vent, if you, don't, if you have a window in your bathroom, of course. If not, make sure you've got a good vent in your bathroom. All right. Uh, just a couple others, making sure that we are keeping the home overall clean, getting rid of as much dust as we can with, I know, easier said than done. But the truth is that uh, mold spores and other forms of mold will link up with the dust and the dust will just kind of blow around the house, move to different areas. Uh, what's another great one? I would say that just our family, we love to have lots of plants in the house. We love to have a lot of nature coming in. You can sometimes get mold in the soil and around these plants. So just make sure you're not getting moldy soil as well. 
The exhaust fans I already touched on, uh, making sure the roof is in good working order since the majority of the leaks will be from the ceiling and roof. Other one is monitor your hot water heater. Hot water heaters can leak. I know they have a pan sometimes. The better ones now will shut themselves down, but many a person has had a hot water leak. Overflowing bathtubs, overflowing sinks, that's a big one. What do you need to do? Bring in a dehumidifier, dry that area right away really fast so that water doesn't allow, isn't allowed to then fester and grow. And the last one is this, and I've got lots of great recommendations on my resource page at stephencabral.com slash resources, but I'll link it up here today as well, right on the page on the show notes. Get yourself a good quality air filter. So if there is some level of mold, remember there's even a little bit of mold outside, some level of mold in the home, but it's not really taking effect anywhere in the house. Here's what you want to do. Good quality air filter. And I can go through the best air filters out there for mold, but you really want to make sure that it has a solid HEPA filter where it's filtering out 99.97%. 99.97%. That's the maximum right now um, of these allergens out of the air. And typically there's a pre-filter there's a HEPA filter, there's a carbon-based filter, um, and sometimes there's even like UV uh, light used as well. But I'll, I'll go through that another day. But a good quality air filter, I'll link up the one that I like. Obviously, all my favorites are on my resources page, but I'll link up the one that I'm using as well at stephencabral.com slash 3287. That is where all of today's show notes will live. If you think you or a child or a family member or loved one is dealing with mold mycotoxin-based issues, and it could be one of their health-based issues, I'm going to also link up that at-home lab test for ages three years old and up, simple urine-based test they can complete. And I'll link that up again at stephencabral.com slash 3287. I know this was a lot, but hopefully this was helpful. Always share the show with anyone you believe it could serve. Next week, I'll be back taking you through the three steps of a mold detox protocol that you absolutely must have in order to begin the healing process. All right, take care, everybody. Have an amazing rest of the day. Thanks so much for tuning into today's show. Before you go, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. I want to make sure that you're getting our daily content, not missing out on anything. Functional medicine, wellness, weight gain, weight loss, anti-aging, living longer, stronger, and all of the most cutting edge research. And if there's any topics you want to hear, feel free to leave them in the comments below. Take care.